waters are those of a tremendous river, the Mekong. Plateau of Tibet, summit of the world. Here, 16,000 feet above the sea, the Mekong rises, feeding on the snows, on the springs from within the earth. Southwards, its gathering waters plunge spreading the Chinese province of Yunnan, sounding through upland gorges, southward, downward, to the lands they call the Lower Basin, where Burma, Laos, and Thailand meet. Greater than its neighbor, Sawin. Greater than Tigris or Euphrates. Greater than Indus, Rome or Hudson. the people of its banks, the Mekong is their own. Its waters are the highway, the crown of life. Respect and joy to the giver of movement, strength, renewal. On to the south it flows, past Vientiane, then pauses, as it were, above the Cone Falls to gather force again. with its tributaries swelling in, Seikan, Seisan, Srapak, it cleaves the broad plains of Cambodia, washes the stone feet of Udon, their ancient capital. the slowly passing Cambodian towns, Stung Treng, Kratie, Kompong Cham. Bringing down the waters of the Great Lake, joins the mainstream at Phnom Penh, Cambodia's capital, the Mekong's largest city. Phnom Penh, the city encircling the hill. royal city, set beside a royal river, a 
million people live here, drawing their strength from the Mekong, pitting their strength in festival against it. Commerce comes up here to this port, a mere 200 miles inland. And on the calm face of the current, they buy and sell. And now the Mekong, entering South Vietnam, begins to multiply to meet the sea. The land lies low, paddy and sandbank and swamp. And had you drifted with the river down its course, from the blizzard of Tibet to the dank heat of the Delta, your journey would have taken you three years. South Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos. The Mekong is more than a river 2,000 miles long. It's an international waterway uniting four countries of Southeast Asia within its lower basin. The basin includes the Great Lake of Cambodia and countless tributaries. Its area is 236 square miles, larger than France, larger than Japan. Its population, 20 millions. Long history walks these forest lands. River bank and lake shore have been settled since time can trace. Water nourished, Angkor rose from the dark jungle carved the moment of its splendor above the treetops, sank once more, engulfed by trunk and tendril, water-fed. And to a priest of Angkor, traveling down river and through the centuries, the Mekong of today would not seem strange. All men still are fishermen, whatever other trade they ply. Most are farmers too, looking to their land to feed themselves, their relatives, their village. Much of the land is still unworkable. Scrub and jungle still invade. But cash crops have taken root. Cotton, tobacco, coffee. Though drainage would improve the yield. There's rubber too. And fine timber, hardwood, teak. More important, there's land to spare, as there isn't in so much of Asia. Land to spare and water to improve it. 
and they understand here how to lift it, channel it, make it work. If you can't master water, you can't grow rice. They grow enough along the Mekong, just enough, to feed the present population. Improve the irrigation, and they could grow a second crop. Control the river's rise and fall, and the risk of failure, hunger, would diminish. Green, then brown. Fertile, then arid. That's the trouble with the Mekong. Water in plenty in the basin as a whole but unevenly distributed in time and place. The rate of runoff from the areas beyond the banks is too high. The river claims its water back too fast. And for months on end, the fields dry out in the tropic sun. Each year, on the Korat Plateau of northeastern Thailand, they must eke the water out and wait. Wait for the rain. In June or July, it comes. The monsoon breaking against the hills, sweeping down the valleys. And at this very time, the Mekong, swollen by melting mountain snow, begins to rise. By November, the waters have done their worst. Rains and river have spent their force. The yearly round begins again. Fall and rise, shortage and surplus, drought and flood. The river sleeps, the forces balance. A moment to rest and to think ahead. For within the lifetime of these children of the river, there'll be not 20 millions in the lower Mekong Basin, 
but 40. Good times ahead, marriage, fecundity, prosperity. Despite the old wives' prophecies, they don't always go together. These days, when statistics predict the future all too clearly, just enough is not enough. When your country's growing, you need not only more food, but all the other things that make life more worth living. Education, health, scope for hand and head. How to put down the new foundations. How to reap from the old seed the means to the new ends. Machines, power, roads, trade, how to seize on what you have and transform it. In the Mekong River, four nations of southeastern Asia share an asset. This river could put the future on their side, feed their growing numbers, support their all-round increase if its flow could be controlled, its wasted forces made creative. So far, the people of the Mekong have been masters of water, but not masters of the river. But suddenly, the world is smaller. Take counsel with those who live by other rivers. Combine experience on the spot with the knowledge of them all and perhaps the giant can be chained. Maintenant, je vais passer la parole aux représentants de la France. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur les membres du comité, depuis notre dernière réunion, il y a six mois, in 1957, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand and South Vietnam formed an international committee under United Nations auspices to direct a series of detailed studies of the Lower Mekong Basin. The committee would work through the Economic Commission for Asia and the Far East with the help of other UN agencies and technical organizations. Its findings would form the first step towards an overall plan for controlling and developing the river. Australia, Britain, Canada, China, France, West Germany, Holland, India, Iran, Italy, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Pakistan, the Philippines and the United States. Sixteen nations are contributing to the studies. Investigating the plateaus of the basin, probing up the main stream and the tributaries, examining the Mekong's entire course from the air, they photographed and mapped, measured rainfall, snowmelt, volume, bed load, recorded speeds of flow. For five years, they collected data, and from the data, a plan emerged. First, a series of major dams along the main stream from northern Laos to the Cambodian plains. Then more dams and barrages on the larger tributaries. This to provide enough stored water to irrigate 10 million acres of new land throughout the year, more than 20 times the present area. And power, four and a half million kilowatts to supply industrial centers and the bigger ports. Finally, a route for trade. The river to be made navigable at all seasons from Vientiane to the sea, 1,500 miles. Mr. President and the members of the committee, at the barrage site, our efforts are now concentrated on drilling the bed of the Western Channel. The detailed planning before construction starts. An Indian engineer reports on the site of a barrage to make the Great Lake a permanent reservoir. Uh, 
Further north, a Japanese team hacks its way through the scrub to Sambor. The shallow rapids here have already suggested the feasibility of a dam. Upstream again, where the Mekong bends into northern Laos, Australian geologists complete their studies of the riverbed for another major dam at Pa Mong. At the downstream location, there's a low sandy island, and we've taken advantage of this as a drilling site. Drilling on the island is still in progress, and it's hoped to complete this hole before the river rises and makes any further work impossible. Despite difficulties, disturbances, plans begin to dovetail ahead of schedule. At the first of four agricultural stations, agronomists are looking beyond the construction phase. What will be the effects of large-scale irrigation? What new crops will be possible? What of life in the river? Will changes in the seasonal flow affect the basin's main source of food? Can breeding programs make it more prolific? And far up in northeastern Thailand, on one of the Mekong's tributaries, they've pushed beyond the planning stage. In 1963, the bulldozers began to shift the earth for the first diversionary dam, a pilot project in an overall scheme that may take 15, 20, 30 years to bring to full completion. Success to you, men of the Mekong, and to all those working with you. What you are starting here, in this decade of development, the world will watch. No small task, even with all the genius, all the vision of the nations, to grapple with that silent primeval force, remake it in the human image. Thank you.